To me, it's beautiful that the word spirit in Latin means to breathe. Welcome to Nature Magic. Today I'm talking to Romero Crago. This conversation was recorded in the botany bubble and not on Zoom, so please excuse some rustling and bumping around the microphone in this fascinating conversation about wild pumas, alpacas, land of fire, environmental philosophy and other magical topics. Romero is from Argentina and is a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute working remotely and living on the farm at Borough Nature Sanctuary with his wife, Nora, and their rescue cat, Alva, who goes around the nature walk on the lead every day. Hi, Ramira. Thanks so much for coming on to the Nature Magic podcast. Uh, Ramira is actually staying on the farm for the last seven months, I think it is, and in lockdown. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your job and what you've been working on remotely? Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I am Ramiro. I am an ecologist. I am from Argentina. Uh, right now, I'm working as a postdoc fellow at the um, a Smithsonian Institution in the U.S. Uh, yeah, because COVID-19, and uh, right now, teleworking from here. So Nora, my wife, she's Irish. So we live together here at the, the farm. It's a lovely place. And... Um, yeah, so I specialize in, in conservation, um, and currently I'm doing, working a couple of projects, but the one that was my main work in the last few years, I uh, started a project in central Kenya, working in the county of Laikipia, a really interesting place because it's, it's, this, it's the second place in Kenya with the most abundant uh, wildlife and in terms of diversity and abundance of big animals uh, only second to the Maasai Mara the famous Maasai Mara region in Kenya but it has no protected areas so it's all private land uh, communal and private uh, land um, most uh, there is different land uses from farmlands to people that do livestock production intensively to ranches where pastoralist people live and other private ranches are called conservancies also private and communal but they they, they can use legal in Kenya the land in the for the purpose of conservation so it's kind of a accepted legal accepted status for the land so they based on they do both they do they livestock uh, uh, farming, but also conservation, uh, eco tourism, so and conservation. So people go and pay for mm -hmm. safaris. So that's how they get revenue and maintain the, the system. And what's your work involve? One of the main problems in the entire region, and probably the same problems everywhere, is population is growing dramatically. In when I was born in the 80s, 84, Kenyan population was around. 14 million people, now it's more than 45 million people. So that, that means we need more food, we need more land transformed to grow crops and more, more cattle, more livestock. So we keep putting more and more pressure on natural ecosystems. Um, so what I have been doing is trying to do a landscape level analysis on how wildlife uh, is being is responding to all these anthropogenic forces like um, increases in livestock, or how life, how wildlife responds to livestock, and what I, we found is of course as you increase livestock abundance, then wildlife tends to decrease. So you lose a species, or like the more rare species disappear, or are more susceptible for that kind of impact. But oh, interestingly, we also found that certain uh, when, when you have moderate level of livestock on the on the landscape coexisting is, is vital is possible so what that's super interesting it's really nice because you can uh, we, we can talk later more about this but we have this idea of we need protected areas and with protected areas we have in excluding people say saving land for just the sake of conserving nature and that has a lot of problems involved because, especially in Africa, where 
humans evolved. You cannot conceive an ecosystem in Africa or in Kenya without people in it. People are part of it. We are part of that nature. And we, we shape the ecosystem. My species adapted to that. We all interact. So the idea of coexisting and living together is really nice to see. But there are, of course, certain levels of activity or pressure we put on the land in which things just start to fall apart. Mm. And you end up with a certification when you get too many animals grazing or overgrazing the certification. It gets more problematic during periods of droughts. So the ecosystem gets less resi resilient to, to that kind of extremes. And then the other part of the world was trying to identify corridors Mm. to maintain those conservancies connected. So if you can think of conservancies of areas where good, there is good grass, good vegetation, can sustain good populations, but they are not really big and animals move a lot. In these systems, in the same way that the pastoralist people adapted to move with the rains, and the rains are scattered and not really predictable. So th there are seasons, but also rains happen scattered in okay. this heterogeneity in, in the landscape. And animals learn how to read that mm. and move following the rains and the, the green grass. People did that too. So they will graze here and then just move their cattle somewhere else. But as land got subdivided after the colonial period and people are putting up fences, all movement is being restricted for pastoralists and also for animal, wild animals. So we're trying to we create maps and, and models, identify those areas that are important to maintain connectivity so mm. populations can maintain that flow of genes and stay healthy. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, so a solution might evolve out of your work at some stage. So thank, yeah, you. thank you for doing idea. that work. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, and it's like I, I like to say always, it's just not me. It's just a big group of people, and yeah. we collaborate. So yeah, to acknowledge that it's always better when we work in groups. True, but thank you for your part in it. Yeah. Um, so just to go back to you grew up in Argentina and your experience with nature growing up. Yeah, so I was born in a town called Tandil. And it's in the middle of the Pampas in Argentina for people... I don't know, it's, it's, if you recognize Buenos Aires in the map, it's like three hours south from Buenos Aires. And yeah, I was born in middle class family and I think I got the gift of loving nature since I have memories. And I had two wonderful parents that fed all that all the way along. So we, with my family, since I'm a kid, we used to go camping everywhere in Argentina, visit many national parks and many wild areas. So I was always fascinated with all the animals. And so I think that I had that connection since I'm a little child. And that also growing in a neighborhood surrounded by natural areas and being able to play in the streams. And one day I remember I brought home 100 frogs from the stream to my mom had them all in the garden. <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, that of course always said. And it was so important to, to be outside and have all those interactions and getting your hands dirty. And yeah, and you were telling me about a certain area um, of rock, I think, where you were standing sometime in your childhood. Well, when, yeah, so in that connection, I remember one of those trips with my parents. Uh, we were in a national park in Patagonia. It's called Parque Nacional Bosque Petrificado. That means the national park of petrified trees. Because Patagonia used to be a forest back in the Carboniferous period, million, millions, millions of years ago. Now all that forest became oil, gas, or rocks. And in this place, you can actually say, you can see the logs of the trees that became rocks exposed by erosion. Amazing. Uh, and it's beautiful, but yeah, I remember I was a kid, I wasn't too old. And I always got fascinated by the um, open areas and why there is no like, wilderness as far as you can see. 
And yeah, these deserts always have this magic. And I remember I started crying, like, but like it was an emotion that was coming from inside, from just being there and surrounded by that vast area of, of nature. Yeah. Mm, very powerful. And yeah, so then I studied zoology. Um, so in all that childhood, I remember I was so happy that I realized I was able, I could study something about animals. So that was something called zoology. I thought I could only study veterinary, like be a vet. But the day I discovered, oh, there is some sci- like a career called zoology. I was so happy, and I there, I went into La Plata University in, um, in near Buenos Aires, and during six years I got my undergrad. And in that finishing that process, then I got the internship, I would say, job with uh, Emiliano Donadios, now a recognized ecologist in Argentina. He was doing his PhD at the moment in West Argentina. So I spent almost three years with him working in the middle of the Andes, and that, that was fantastic. And yeah, so I started to get this, in my process of growing as a person, as a professional, in ecological sciences. Early on, I got into these remote, pristine areas. And nat- this national park was one of them. It's probably one of the most remote areas you can g- go in Argentina. To get to the park, we had to travel eight hours across the river, like four times. And we were like that far away from any humans. No phone, no nothing, no contact. More than the radio to tell that we were alive every Oh, twice a day to fantastic. the park rangers. Yeah, and what were you studying? So in th- this study was about um, traffic cascades, or what we call, it, and this the, the idea of how predators, top predators, affect prey, and how the prey later have an effect on the grass. Or it could be the other way around as well, that the grass maintains prey and the prey maintain the predator. So we're trying to understand how the ecosystem works in that way. And this has the implications because because this is a pristine area, almost non-invasive species. It is as it was before Columbus arrived to America. You can understand how the ecosystem functions in the pristine way. Yeah, and, and what b- with the predators and what with the prey? Yeah, so in this case, this was perfect system because it's simple, it's in the middle of the desert, so there's one top predator, that's the puma, or cougar, some people know it, and wonderful predator. So, and I, I, I was always obsessed with cats, big cats, so this was fantastic. We'll never forget the same, the first time I saw a puma in the wild. And then, the two main prey there are are these camelids, so guanacos and vicuñas, and they feed on these grasslands in the high Andes. It's, like, it's very desert, so it's not really abundant vegetation, but these camelids are adapted to these extreme environments really well. And what we're trying to understand is how the behavior of the vicuñas and guanacos change based on how they perceive Puma, like the fear of being predated by like puma, and with that, how they sh- like this, they call the ecosystem of fear, because the the prey will try to shape behavior depending where the predator is hunting, and um, then the yeah vicuñas and guanacos will feed differently on different parts of the ecosystem. They, oh. So grass may grow be, be longer in rocky areas, more dangerous than the open plains where they can see far away and detect pumas up trying to hunt them more easily. Yeah, so the and vicuna would be the predecessor of the alpaca, which is the farm... Um, yes, the dom- domestic. Just for people who don't know what yes. the vicuna is. So, yeah, so the alpaca is the domesticate, domest- was domesticated by the Incas uh, from vicuñas, and llamas were domesticated from guanacos. And we have our representatives here in the farm with Jazz and, and Frank. Yeah, Frank is the llama, Jazz. <laughs> but Jazz has now a companion, right? Yes, yeah, so Jazz is a, our alpaca. And he, we, he was actually a rescue. He's, he's a senior. And we got him when he was 13. I'm not sure how long they, they live in the wild. But 
Yeah, well, in the wild, it depends I on don't really know, but depends. generally, yeah, they get predated. Yeah, yeah so, um, well, the, the herd said that he was way too old for breeding. He was about 12 at the time, and they said he might last for a couple of years. They didn't want him. Um, he, that was seven years ago, so he's 19 now, and he's absolutely fine. He's healthy as anything. And he came with another senior uh, female who had stopped breeding, and they didn't want her either. And unfortunately, we lost her. Uh, so we looked for a friend for him, and we ended up, we had to buy Dolly, who is one Dolly. years old. <laughs> and so he's allowed to see her at the moment. They are going to go into the field together in about May. Oh, so nice. that if they do mate, that it wouldn't be too early next year for her. And she's, she's big enough. She's about one now. Nice. So he's extremely happy. He, he, we put him in with some sheep, and he loved the sheep, but the sheep were terrified of him. So he ended up just chasing them around. He doesn't like the goats very much, so he was really lonely. And he doesn't like Frank at all. Frank and Jazz have, um, hate each other. Uh, they, <laughs> they had an initial fight where Jazz actually split Frank's ear, which you can still see. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So they really, and they swear at each other across the fence. Uh, so now he has Dolly. Anyway, we'll go back to your stories. <laughs> yeah, well, Frank is a character <laughs> He's for sure. He's such a character. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that was the, yeah, the studies in the Andes. And then I went to yes. the first time, 2010, I believe. Yeah, and I did a master's and then a PhD. And in the PhD, I moved to a completely different ecosystem but in southern Chile, in an island called Navarino Island, the extreme south of South America. So if you look at the map and you go to the south, 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 south of the continent, you will see these islands. All this archipelago is called Cape Horn. And yeah, I did my PhD there working with invasive species, and this is forest ecosystem again pristine and this is to contrast with uh, Kenya now where there's no national parks, no protected areas and more human modified and uh, so but in that, that landscape in Navarino Island one of the greatest experiences in my life and there are these ideas of conservation, on the, the idea of setting land apart, let it untouched by humans, that I, because I grew up like in seeing those areas, and in Argentina we have a really nice national park system. Uh, and then the experiences there with the Yagan community, the, it's like the Native, Amer uh, Native Americans or Aborigines, that existed in the land where the first humans, is the last place on earth that humans colonized or like, really? occupied uh, 7,000 years ago. And the Yagans are this group of aborigines that lived in canoes. Uh, that's why that, uh, the island, the big island there is called Tierra del Fuego. It's the land of fire because these groups of, this, uh, the Yagans lived in canoes, in families, and each canoe will have a fire in the middle. So when Fitzroy arrived in the Beagle, with Darwin was another one there in the, sh in, the, in the ship, the first thing they saw was all these fires across the So the canoes coastline. as in a boat? Yeah, they, they, they made the canoes with, with the bark of the trees. And they had a fire in the canoe? Inside the canoe to stay warm. Yeah, and they lived in the canoes. They 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 will go, they do all all the hunting. They yeah. depend largely on the sea. Wow. So yeah. Interesting. And that's how they, they call it the land of fire. It was all these little fires. Wow. But experiencing them with them there was revealing because I real these guys were telling me well, of course the suffering of oppression and and colonialism. Like, when you experience that in first hand, and when they tell you, but you come here with your ideas of conservation, and I lived in harmony with the ecosystem for thousands of years. I was able to put down a tree to create my, make my canoe, right, and go around the different islands, no problem, and then you come and tell me, you have to protect the forest, so I cannot cut a tree anymore, I have to get a permit from the government to cut a tree. Just because you don't know how to live, you Westerners don't know how to live with nature. Now we impose all those rules, but we live for seven thousand years, 
with no problem. And then I started to, that, that was a huge challenge to me to, understand, to, to, to question myself what I was doing. And what is conservation and how, how, we, how, how we understand nature. And, and that's when I started to get more into philosophy. And in, in that university, there's a really nice philosophy program, environmental philosophy program in the University of North Texas. And my professor, Ricardo Rozzi, gave me a lot of the lessons together with many friends that they have today, and other colleagues, and even Nora, my wife, she's a philosopher, environmental philosopher. And, but yeah, so I started to try to inquire, why do we see nature as this other thing that we need to protect? What, why is that that is separated from us? When did that happen? Like, sometimes if you ask for translation in many of these uh, Aboriginal languages, what is how you translate nature? They may not have a, a word for nature. They, they have a word for trees, for landscape, for, 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 for where they live, for the environment. But, but they don't see nature as something away from them. They are nature. They are part of nature. We are nature. Yeah. And that, is, was, that was one of the revealing processes on thinking and, and in this yeah, in this in my professional career, what we do, we, we try to conserve, and how we, yeah, face all the challenges, and we try to solve the problems we have mm. now as human society. So, when do you think this um, road split, where one one path was people and one path was nature, rather? Yeah, well, having written, and there are many different theories. Of course, it depends on the author and thinkers. Um, some claim that the first division of humans from, from wilderness was during the, uh, the farm revolution, agricultural revolution, sorry, when people started to domesticate plants and then we, we stopped being hunter-gatherers and we created communities surrounded by crops who are producing food. And then we are trying to protect that food. So we started to engineer the, the ecosystem around us. And then the wilderness starts to be everything that was away. And we started to try to protect those crops from the mm -hmm. natural elements, I would say. That's one. Um, another one that to me is more important. Uh, so that's like the idea of wilderness, but more the idea of nature becoming something different. Uh, happened in England actually here out here and when the industrial revolution and all the when the industry and when we started to burn coal uh, uh, cities start to be covered in this black uh, dust and all the pollution started to happen and then you have a visually really distinct view of the city with no life totally dark gray with the contrast with the countryside, with the green landscapes. Mm. And that's, yeah, as people start to concentrate in cities in England, mm. and then... And that's when the landscape painting grew up, because yeah, they wanted exactly. to bring the landscapes. Yeah, the queen was asking to, like, bring me those represent paintings from the landscape that you see, maybe on the explorations in Africa and stuff like that. Uh, and other like, sides of Europe. So then, like the, the distinction between the people living in the city and the nature was something outside mm. there. There is also uh, another thing that uh, to me is super important. That is when, when the idea of private property also that happens in England, and how we start to put value to the land mm. from labor. So you have to labor the land, make it produce something for you to have value. Mm -hmm. And if it's not that, then it's wild, it's wilderness. Yeah, this is really giving a problem now with the common agricultural policy. Because any area that is bushy or unproductive, for instance, 25 acres, which is half of this farm, you don't get a farm payment for. Hmm. So which is obviously encouraging everyone to rip out any bushes, hedges, um, but it, I mean, this is changing now. There's there's new rules, and there's been um, they've looked into it a little bit. Hopefully, it'll change. But about ten years ago, we had the Department of Agriculture guy came here 
and he wanted to check the pasture area of the farm. And he said, look, um, I don't believe about the pasture area down in the rocks. I'm going to go and measure the bits of grass that you've <laughs> down there. Wow. I said, OK. Uh, so he went down into the rocks where we yeah. now have a nature walk, but at the time we didn't have a walk at all. It's completely wild with rocks and bushes. And that was 10 o'clock in the morning, and we were living up at the farmhouse. So at 4 o'clock, and he had a GPS with him and everything. Yeah. 4 o'clock, he knocked on the door and said, like, I've finished. And I said, oh, were you in Kimvara? Did you have lunch in Kimvara or something? And he said, no, I've been stuck in your bushes. I got lost. It's, it's only 25 acres. It's not huge, and he had a GPS. <laughs> now, there are fairies down there. <laughs> so he had been stuck there for five hours wandering around in circles, wow. trying to measure bits of grass. Anyway, that's the side point. But, but yeah, yeah. And, and coming back to the idea of desserts, I like so much is because because they are so hard to farm. We see those as empty places, and I okay. was always astonished with the idea why you see that as empty, it's full of diversity and amazing animals with mm. unique adaptations, like the vicuñas or alpacas, yeah. adapted yeah. to live in these high areas with low oxygen and really harsh conditions and and they have a special ab adaptation in their blood the yeah the yeah actually for that low yeah. low oxygen level in the in the air they have the, the, the red cells are a little different so they have more area yeah. so they can trap more oxygen mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and can you tell uh, the listeners about the hunting pattern of the vicunas and the pumas um, you were telling me how they bunch together oh, yeah. because uh, we, I have to say now, we have done this interview, this is the second time because I failed to press save, <laughs> which is so infuriating. Um, yeah. So I do know a little bit yeah. about uh, Ramirez's work, but he was tagging the Vicuna babies to yeah. mark them and explaining about the puma hunting. Yeah, so one of the questions that we're trying to answer is, how long, what's the chance that the newborn, or the probability that the newborn will pass the year of life? So basically how many of these little guys were being eaten by pumas or other predators like foxes. And so to do that, the problem is that once they get killed or they die, then we have the, the Andean condors that are the big kind of the big vultures. Reptile. Oh, oh, so, oh like, sorry. They are scarpengers. So, oh, yeah, like vult. What are they, they called? Vult they are Andean condors. Okay. Yeah, it's the, uh, oh, the largest, Andean condors, right? the largest bird that oh, flies. Wow. That can fly. The largest bird that flies? Yeah, it's more than the two world. meters, two meters of wingspan. Like this massive the bird. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, it's amazing to so see. So they, the, they take the carcass? They can eat. I have seen them eat and completely an entire vicuña in hours where you go from the entire vicuña to just bones mm. in hours wow. and they, they yeah i have seen more than 60 condors or flying and they start to circle like like in the movies yeah and, and they just go there actually once i fall asleep after trying to find one of the things in the middle of the with, with some friends don't tell just me they were pecking you holding up and i opened my eyes and i had a condor flying on top of me uh, uh, if i slept 15 minutes i was going to tasty. wake up with <laughs> <laughs> being pecked by a condor. But yeah, the, we needed to, the, the, the only solution to do that is put a transmitter, so uh, like a radio attached to the ear of this big little vicuña that will give us a sign whether they were alive or not. So we, every day we go and check on them. And to do that, we have to wait until they were born. And when they were born, we have 15 minutes before they learn how to run because then you cannot catch them. Imagine <laughs> running at 3,000 meter elevation. It's just really <laughs> run and you have no oxygen in your diet. So we have to catch them before they learn how to walk, feed them the transmitter, and then, uh, and then leave them. And, and mom would come back. And that's why in, we got, for, for people to know that camelids, the way they defend is by spitting at you. Like, like Frank loves to do that and show you he's angry at you. Uh, yeah, we had to separate the mom, of course, after 11 months carrying that baby finally comes to life and you are there. They don't really like it. <laughs> so we have to have two people, one keeping that vicuña aside. And that will be the one we'll get green. And then the other one, which is in, in less than a minute, just feed the transmitter, sex it, wait it and release it. 
and then we could follow those guys for a year of life and um, yeah and then we find what was interesting is we were measuring how aggressive the mums were towards us and it was really interesting that more aggressive those uh, mums were towards us more likely the little one will make yes. it through the year of life yeah. Uh, so they were more protective. Other ma- other abicunias will just run away and look from far, and then they will come back. Mm. But um, yeah, and, and those who are more likely to be predated, I guess. Oh, it was interesting. But it was super in, in, like amazing to see on, on the behavior of all these animals when when you like abicunias are constantly scanning. And when they detect uh, when they detect the puma, they give this alarm. It's, yeah, it's a particular noise they make. And then immediately, it, how many thousand bikunis are there? They all look at that one place where the puma is. And once they identify the predator, the puma, all the moms with it, they live in families, but all the moms with the little ones, the juvenile, or with the, yeah, the, the little ones will just group together. And then the silver adults, especially the males, they will surround the group to protect the little ones. So even though they don't belong to the same family, then they are constantly fighting for feeding territories when they are in families. But when the predator is there, they put aside all the differences and group together to protect yeah. the little ones. And then the, the male juveniles will run in front of the predator and like escort him outside, uh, away, and just kind of show them Look how fit I am. They, they run around him, and the puma has to leave. It has no chance getting. Because yeah, the puma hunting. would have to be within 10 meters and yeah, sneak they, up on them to get exactly. it. Exactly. So, so these are. They have a great strategy. Yeah, are ambush predators. <laughs> they need guys. Ha, they have to be really close to actually yeah. have a chance to grab. Yeah. So if them. the alpacas here, they're getting used to them more, but if they see a dog, they sound the alarm. They yeah. don't like dogs. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, they, they have it. Yeah, days. they're getting a little bit used to it because people walk past them constantly. So, oh, oh well. <laughs> but um, you said that you're one of your favourites. Well, you loved the big cats when you were a child. They were your favourite. But can you tell us about the time when you got close to the puma? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was saying that, yeah, I was, since little I was obsessed with cats. I love tigers. When I was a child, I loved tigers. And yeah, then when I had this opportunity to be there surrounded by predators, it was fascinating. And once happened that, we, had to collect, we were collecting skulls and other parts of the carcasses to do further analysis. So we, in the morning, we were doing our work and we see this Puma with a fresh carcass, so probably killed it an hour before we arrived there. So we say, well, let's let it eat, and then we come back in the afternoon and collect the skull of the vicuña. And when we come back in the afternoon, and the puma had dragged the carcass into the grasses, the long grasses, so you could see the, the mark. And at the same time, we see a puma in the far away distance, like going away. So we say, okay, he just hide it, and that puma is walking away. So we're confident, so I jump off the track, and I start following the, the trace, trying to find this vicuña, the carcass of the vicuña. And as I'm walking with the grass to my knees, 10 meters in front of me, this puma stands up and looks at me in the eyes. And that was the most frightening and fascinating <laughs> moment of my life. And it was just rare, 10 meters away with this top predator. And I think that's when experiences are so deep because it's when you are fragile, when your life is hanging. And, and we have no arms, no pepper gas, uh, pepper spray, anything to protect us. Um, it's just there and... And it was fascinating because the puma was more scared of us, of me, than, than yeah. I was of him. And despite he had the food there, the carcass, so it was, there was a second puma there. And he just stood up and slowly moved away, oh. kind of relentless. 
So then we went quickly, got the skull, <laughs> and ran away. <laughs> oh, away that's absolutely it. brilliant. But it was fascinating. Yeah. Brilliant. I had a few more encounters with them. Yeah, so that, is a, that was a kind of spiritual experience. Do you have any other spiritual experiences with animals or with nature? Yeah, well, here, I will bring here the, the, the lessons from my professor, Ricardo. And to me, it's beautiful that the word spirit in Latin means to breathe. Um, and also, so how Aristotle was calling the anima, so the, this kind of the soul of organisms. So basically, the idea of having a spirit is being able to breathe. And we share that with all organisms alive in the world. So th this grass that is right next to us is breathing, so we're spiritually connected. And I love that idea of thinking, when I'm sp I, I am spiritually connected every day with everything around me, and because we are breathing the air that plants are producing from the energy of the sun, mm. And that is a lovely way, a story, a, w a way of seeing how connected and how we are nature. That's Maybe beautiful. That's that. really beautifully put. So, and, and that to me may explain why, and it's more personal, but why when I'm in a city surrounded by concrete, I don't feel the same spiritual connection mm. with my surroundings that are why I'm on top of a mountain. I was always, I want, I, I question myself, why if I go to the top of the Empire State in New York, I don't feel the same that I am at the top of a mountain anywhere. Like the, con the spiritual, you know, the feelings you have, are, to me, are not the same. And I, I think there is something there in our instincts and our roots, in who we are, and in that idea that we are nature, and when we are back in the elements, there is something instinctively there mm. that make us, I mean, that makes me feel like spiritually connected. At the same time, I think that, well, we have this spirituality and the idea where you know, the feelings you have, are, to me, are not the same. And I, I think there is something there in our instincts and our roots, in who we are, and in that idea that we are nature, and when we are back in the elements, there is something instinctively there mm. that make us, I mean, that makes me feel like spiritually connected. At the same time, I think that, well, we have this spirituality and the idea we are connected. Um, but also we have experiences, or we saying with the, with the Puma experience, that your, your adrenaline brings yeah. you to a level of, of experiencing things, and that's how, probably how many people doing this risk sport they enjoy so much, because when you feel like fragile is when probably when you have your deepest emotions and connection with with the land or with everything. And I remember when I was in Kenya, there was a period of one week where I was staying in a ranch in the middle of Lake Ipia, and for a period of one week there was this herd of elephants that were coming down close to the to the houses where I was sleeping and yeah, I remember going there with a beard and sitting just being uh, uh, against the wind so the, the wind will not bring my smell to the elephants. Elephants have really bad vision but they smell really well so they see they know that you are there if they can smell you and they have really good sense of smell so if you have to put against the wind but it was amazing just sitting there and letting the herd come really close to me and like hear them, hear the, how they communicate. The, the elephants use these cultural sounds they make to connect with, like talk to each other. I don't know how you call it, but they are clearly communicating. And, and it's amazing because you, you can hear like one elephant making noise from the bush. You don't see the elephant. But the other ones are responding. You hear how they talk, like how they communicate. It's amazing. That's amazing. And you hear them crash, like crushing those branches, and oh. Oh, that 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 also a level of connection. But yeah, and it's funny because I think we as humans tend to think about communication only from verbal perspective, but in like 
we like animals communicate with us in with gestures and we like they that's how we all understand each other so if you know how to read the behavior of animals you can communicate with them pretty easy and it's super i i, I like to sometimes when you go to youtube in kroger national park in south africa and you see these elephants turning around cars stuff like that if you know the reading elephant know the behavior that elephant warned that car like four times, like really? get away from me, mm. or, get away from my space or I'm going to attack you. Like, like animals don't want to fight. That's yeah. the last thing they want to do because they put their lives at risk. So they will warn you and they will display. When you see animals displaying like growling and all those yeah. noises they make, they Listen. are trying. Listen to them. <laughs> yeah, they're they showing that they will display how strong and they will measure each other, but they will try to not fight. And when they, that happens, is because there was a lot of miscommunication. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so you were talking about um, the lichens or the lichens down in yeah, I South, think South America. It was related to, yeah, when, when you asked me about what was my favorite animal. And, uh, oh, yes. And yeah. I, 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 yeah, when I was a kid, I, I loved cat, big cats and tigers and pumas, of course, and but also it's true that I realized later on how much I got influenced by all the documentaries from Discovery Channel and I was watching on National Geographic, I was watching when I was a kid. So you get to love what you know and, and these charismatic species are fantastic because there is clearly a connection with how we connect with these majestic animals and you can read that in all the cosmology. You know cosmovisions of a lot of uh, cultures, you know, how they, the ravens, such magical animal, and you see they are so important in so many cultures. Really, because you saw ravens um, yesterday, yesterday displaying yeah, over display. the barren. So beautiful, right close on here, like flying and displaying and making these noises, that's so fantastic to watch. Do, but you know, do you know the, anything about the raven in um, indigenous cultures? What the raven means? Or? Well, I, I work in my PhD actually when I was in Chile. Part of my philosophical work, uh, I use some of the cosmovisions of the an Aboriginal group, the Coyucons, that live in Alaska, and in in, in they they in their idea of the creation of the world is this raven that, um, yeah, that's like the god. That was the creator. That we can say that the, yeah, that created the, the world as it is. And the book is called Make Prayers to the Ravens. And so I realized that, yeah, of course, that charismatic species are nice. But when I was in southern Chile, there are no really, mammals and birds are not really diverse there. There's diversity is more low, but one group of organisms that tend to be super diverse in that area are bryophytes, so uh, mosses and liverhoods, and so these tiny little things, plants, and fascinating because in in that program we we, we talk about the lenses with which you look at the world. And when you you get to experience, and so they, here are two two important things: the experience. So once you connect with those with that diversity, you have a different understanding. So I, I got to love uh, to look into the into the soil and identify all these little different plants. Sometimes, like with Nora, we go looking for flowers, and, and she's really good at flowers. So I'm learning from her all the time. And seeing all the, now in the spring, it's so beautiful. So it's not just the charismatic big mammals, but all these tiny things. It's just diversity that is so powerful and enrichful and lovely. And and then also in my career, I went from studying one animal to another to even plants. But then I started to love the interactions. So how different species interact like how pumas affect prey and they affect the, the vegetation and then in the vegetation live all these small mammals, all these insects. So there is all this like network 
of connections and interactions in the natural world that are so, so important and to, to maintain healthy ecosystems. Yeah. And when it's you remove top predators, then you, you, that has cascading effects and consequences. And you see here in Europe, like, um, only few predators. And, and that, that, that's important for maintaining a healthy ecosystem. Mm. Is this the area that you're going to work in in the future, then, interactions? I'm su super interested in, in, in that. In, in, I really love understanding how top predators uh, function, or how, how top predators are also primary producers, like grasses, how that shape the energy that flows there, mm. uh, how different species get after the behavior changes depending whether it's a top predator or not. Uh, makes these ecosystems work in such mm. harmony. Well, now uh, there's the movement for rewilding. Um, there may be opportunities to work in that area, different yeah. areas being rewilded and introducing wolves and exactly. bears and things like that. Yeah, so one of the main areas of interest for me is like the idea of restoration ecology. And, uh, and yeah, rewilding is definitely one of them. Now the, there's a big project in Argentina and that is doing some fantastic work, introducing jaguars now there for the first time in certain provinces in Argentina. Introducing what? Jaguars. What are they? The, this the big cat, the, the largest cat in, in, in the Americas. Oh, wow. Uh, they call it the tiger because okay. when the Spanish arrived, right. the most similar thing was, they, okay. they look like a big jaguar, the big, big leopard. Okay. Yes. Yeah, jowers. So, what would be your ideal job? So, my uh, I love teaching as well. That's a big part. So, my, I always wanted to be a professor, and that's where I'm aiming to, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And but yeah, I, I really would like to. My ideal job is where I can balance life with doing research. That, that, that's passion for me, trying to understand how things work. With teaching, education for me is fundamental piece of this society. Like we need to educate our kids mm. to, if we want to better understand what's going on and have a chance of changing the course of things right now for a better future for everybody. And and at the same time, of course, balancing your life. Like fortunately, right now it's a little bit. It's system we're living in, okay, we have so many of us, and like we live all through all these economic crises, of course, COVID is not making things easier. But there is a lot of um, pressure in this system to be productive and this and that. So ideally, I would like to get into an institution that values mm. quality of life and quality of education, mm. and, what, and values quality more than quantity, but somehow okay. So that, that will be my idea. Good. Well, let's we'll see if I can find you it. You will. You will. It's out there now, so you definitely will. Um, yeah, what positive actions can we do then to support nature? I think the first, one of the most important parts is what we have been talking today about being, being back and understanding that we are nature. I thought going outside and having uh, first face-to-face -face experiences with nature, with, uh, with with your surroundings, is super important. You want, you will not change your behavior and your attitudes. And this has been there are a lot of studies showing this. You will not change attitude, no matter how much information I give you, or how bad something can be for the environment. You will not change your behavior and your attitudes towards those behaviors unless you have first experiences. Experience. Mm. So there's nothing like, if you want to love predators, you need to see a wolf to the eyes. You need to see a lynx to the eyes. You need to, to have that face-to-face -face encounter with a fox or with a badger, mm. with a pine marten, to understand, to, to, to empathize with that. But you also need to be on the ground looking at the flowers and at the grass. You need to breathe the air and spiritually connect with all these organisms. So I think we need to get out there and live experience. And that's one thing that I think is 
fundamental for for reconnecting and because at the end of the day how we behave is all like shaped by by ethics by morality so how we interact with our neighbors or with other human beings uh, or we are part of society how we understand our role in society has to do what the ethical framework we have but if we don't have an ethical framework towards other than human organisms we we it will be really difficult to to really coexist with with all the wildlife that is outside the natural beings because if we don't have any morality any good or wrong if we don't know if we don't act, if we cut in a tree we don't we don't judge that from an ethical point of view then it will be really hard and it's that removing morality from other than humans it what allows us to or we don't allows us to have industrial farming, yeah. Because we can eat a chicken that was had a really bad life, just because we don't have any morality towards that. Mm. And we can cut the forest, and clear cut the forest, because we don't have, we don't see any bad or wrong or good or bad with that. There is no structure for for morality. So we need to have a connect with nature and. What I, I think about connecting with nature relates to morality because as my professor Ricardo would point out or explain the idea of ethic, the word ethic, in the early, early roots of the word meant the den. Meant the den, your home. Okay. Ethic means the yeah, den. Yeah, so it's basically coming back to the den, it's coming back to our root ethics of interacting with or living with other than humans, I would call it. And that's ecology as well. It's the study of the house, the mm. study of our den. Yeah. And, and that's the ecosystem ecology. Yeah. Oh, it's so interesting. I'm finding it very hard to not to interrupt you all the time. So <laughs> it's really good. Um, and I think leading on from that, if you had the magic wand, what would you do for the planet? Yeah, I think uh, this is a really tricky question and I thought about this a lot but one thing I would like to for uh, all of us to try to remove is the individuality this idea of we are us and everything we do is to benefit us more than anything else and I think that's it's also part of understanding we are social creatures and we live in communities and we, if we can remove all that sense of individuality and start to behave in ways that empathize with your community, and with this I mean the community of life, your community, like your friends, your family, the other humans that live in your community, but also the community of life, like the trees and the plants, the birds that live around you. And and I think by if we remove individualism, we, we, sh we can solve. There are so many things right nowadays that are related to your individual benefits that mm. are more important. And you, you can, can uh, you're blind to the consequences of that individual behavior. And a lot of our society is about comfort and making our lives easier. Mm. And we price that more than the consequences that that may have because that requires energy and, mm. you know. But the, it's important for me to start thinking at the community of life. So I, I will try to prioritize the community and the people around me and the animals around me more than my own benefits. So with that, we can remove all these problems of individual benefit on the property if we can try to say, well, let's try to do practices that just don't only benefit me economically or in my lifestyle, make my life easier, but that benefits all the organisms living, like the birds. Like the, mm. the I think we can't, we can't go into this, but um, I also there's a strong message from religion about, you know, man has dominion over the wildlife. And that's a bit of a problem. We don't have dominion. We want to move to cooperation. But here, 
in, into that line, and here we are in a country in Ireland where it's mostly Catholic, and I'm also raised Catholic in Argentina, and, and now we have the Pope that is Argentinian. Yeah. But the Pope calls himself Francis, and that is because uh, Francis the Sixth. And Francis was, when he was writing, in his writing, he talked about the brother Burn. So Francis also had that connection with, with the other than humans and had that morality towards other than humans. Yeah. And that's why the encyclical that the Pope wrote is super important because he talks a lot about the importance of looking at the environment, what we are doing. We are not masters of nature. Yeah. And so even in, in like, yeah, I would, Ricardo will tell me that religion is diverse as well. So we can find mm. places where even in our own beliefs, we can look at. That's a good, that's a good find, message. Yeah, yeah, and find that if, uh, and f yeah, and find that idea of, of connecting with the world and seeing it in a, yeah, in more spiritual, magical yeah. way. Yeah. And it has to do a lot with the roots of our society are so embraced modernity in mechanicism and reductionism and the idea that animals and plants are robots mm -hmm. and machines. So because they are machines, they have no souls, it's dualisms. So because they are, have no soul and they are machines, they don't have any moral, moral, moral value. So we can do whatever we want. We can put a chicken to a farm factory and oh, yeah. make it fat in two weeks and eat it because it's a machine and yeah. that thinking so get, getting back to to nature is also understanding that the world is not a machine the world is alive mm -hmm. there are a lot of organisms that we are connected to each other we all depend on each other the idea of, it, of us as individuals that can master nature and live totally independent from nature is is so wrong because you won't be alive if you try to be yourself. You de your life depends on so many bacteria that mm -hmm. are absorbing nutrients for you, that are helping you digest your food, you eat the food you eat, that are, yeah, that are producing uh, oxygen. Most mm -hmm. of the oxygen we breathe comes from the algae in the ocean. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I think if we try to move away from these ideas of individualism and mechanicism and seeing the world as a machine, and we can reconnect yeah. um, with, with the organisms and live in this community of life. And Very enjoy. good. Great. But actually, talking about St. Francis, so before I do any interview, I always do a meditation. Yeah. And I always invite St. Francis and St. Therese, so St. Francis to speak speak for the animals and St. Therese of Lisier, who was called the Little Rose, to come and be the chair or whatever, speak for the plants to get the right messages out there. Beautiful. So, so. That's you. Um, there's one other slightly not as exciting question, but do you want to tell us your um, recommended books? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have been reading quite some interesting books, but if I have to choose two, I, I always love animal behavior. And so my two books are related to that. Two books I'm going to recommend. And one is The Elephant Whisperer. This is a story of a South African guy that had a, bought a piece of land and started a reserve. And there was a herd of elephants that were going to be killed because they were too, too, un, uh, they were making too much trouble, breaking fences, going into riding crops, so they were unmanageable. And this guy say, no, those animals cannot die, bring them. So he prepared a big, like, fenced area where he kept his elephants. Of course, they escaped. So the story is lovely. <laughs> and it's about how he managed to connect with the herd of elephants, with, especially with the matriarch of that elephant herd. Uh, the connection he had with those elephants was lovely. Or is Anthony. 
And when he died, um, he became quite famous because there's videos or photographs, I think, of all the elephants um, arrived. They were wild at that stage, I think. They came yeah, back yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. They came back to his house when he died and just hung around grieving. Yeah, it was kind house. of a, what would we say? Yeah, grieving. It was an incredible story. There's also another book on saving rhinos, where also fascinating story. And the, the other book I really enjoy is called Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? And it's from Franz de Wolf. And I love this book because it just shows us how limited in our human anthropocentric way of think, seeing things we are. And so basically, it goes all around animal behavior. And has lovely stories and seeing how biased we were in our, and trying to prove that we are the smart ones and that animals are all dumb or machines, basically. And yeah, so it's incredible to see the stories there and the things animals can do to communicate, to solve problems, and adapt to the daily struggles of, of, the, of the daily lives and to survive. And so it's fantastic, it's really, really, really good good book and it also has to do with the say that we're talking about mechanicism reductionism and the sciences are basically as a root of science and the sciences scientific minds have been so restricted i would say by these mindsets so people like these books are making good progress and I, now in science i think there's fantastic work in Making, showing that animals have cultures, like the studies with orcas are fascinating. Yeah. Like how these different families have different strategies and different ways to communicate with whales as well. Um, and other, uh, like we also thought, and I, I was always super interested in the idea that all ecological theory in the 20th century was shaped by the idea of competition, of these individuals competing with each other to survive the struggle of the mm. fittest and now the so this now always against the idea of cooperation and communities and now there's all this new work showing that actually trees are interconnected by this network of fungi and they are all communicating first and then they are sharing food so the carbon that the sugar that a tree produces from the light and, and the CO2, that sugar is not being used by that tree. Sometimes they send that sugar through the network of fungi to another tree that needs it. And so we know so little about this, but the idea that there is so much, like community in nature is so much more important than competing with each other. Uh, and I think all this new innovative research that is coming now is kind of challenging all these ideas are for the good. And we mm. think we're making good progress in that way. That's brilliant. I think that's a great place to end. So um, I hope now I press save correctly <laughs> on this. <laughs> Thank good. you so much, Ramira. That was fascinating. Thank you so much yeah. for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Nature Magic. Please keep tuning in every two weeks. We have some very cool episodes coming up. I've been talking to Dan the Rehabber about starting the first wildlife hospital in Ireland and also the fabulous Indigenous American poet and storyteller, Dr. Joseph Bruchak. Please subscribe and share our podcast to increase the reach. Tell your friends and give us a rating if you like it. It all helps spread a positive voice for nature. In news this week, we are listing our award-winning cafe and retail area at Borough Nature Sanctuary for lease, and we are looking for an eco-friendly tenant. I'll put the link to the listing in the show notes, or you can contact us through the Borough Nature Sanctuary website. Please tell any friends who may be interested in this wonderful opportunity. Thank you.